Yes. That's fair. Okay, let's get going. Happy New Year, everybody. New Year. Welcome to the Wednesday, January 16th, 2019 meeting of the Community Preservation Committee. Uh, as always, we start with general public comment, of which we have no general public. We do have two folks who are joining us. Uh, the first is Bob Wagner, who is on the Hatfield CPC, uh, and is also the steering committee for the statewide Community Preservation Coalition. Uh, the second person, as I, most of us know, is Stuart Sag Sagnar. Stuart Sagnar. Sagnar? How do you spell your last name? You got it, Sagnar. Sagnar. Um, who will be doing a formal presentation to us about the role of the Community Preservation Coalition and how it can benefit us. Um, we'll be joined later at around 7.45 by four members of the Housing Partnership uh, folks, uh, Todd, Patrick, uh, Julio, and Becky. So they'll be presenting some of the housing issues uh, for us. Um, before we get to that, a couple things. First is, we had minutes that were sent to us dated November the 7th. Is there a motion to approve those minutes? Second. Uh, any comments? <coughs> All in favor? All opposed? Okay. Um, so just a couple things for my chair's report before we move on to Stuart. Uh, I spent the afternoon uh, we went up to finish up the Leeds Historic District signage stuff. If people haven't done that, it's really worth 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 doing. Uh, my wife then pushed me in my wheelchair down the rail trail there to the Haydenville line, uh, which was just a delightful afternoon. Driving back, we passed Florence Fields, Florence Community Gardens, the Dow South, uh, Hampshire County Friends of the Homeless, House and Start. Uh, and then coming in this evening, I looked over and there's Forbes, the Academy of Music, Pulaski Park, uh, right next door, City Hall. Um, and I just wanted to reflect on how grateful I am for the town that we live in and the Community Preservation Act and our local committee and the really good work that we do. So just to appreciate all of you as volunteers and all of us uh, for doing the good work and for Sarah for guiding us through that. So it's really a delight to see what a big difference uh, we make in the, in the life of our community. Um, the City Council has not looked yet or not been presented yet <coughs> with our uh, recommendations from the fall. They will be meeting on February 7th. One reason is we've got a little tinkering to do on the uh, Village Hill Apartments project. So Sarah wanted to present all of all of those. Um, good news, bad news. Uh, I'll start off with the bad news. The accessibility grant that the city applied for did not come through. Um, nor did the Florence Fields grant that the rec department applied for. <coughs> so that's unfortunate on those two levels. That's the bad news. The good news, or flip side, is that we get $166,200 for this cycle, which brings us up to somewhere around $300,000, which is twice as much as we thought we would uh, get. Um, so it's unfortunate those grants didn't come, and uh, um, but we do get a, a little bit of, of windfall from that. Sarah's informed me that there are a number of proposals that, uh, that are coming in. They are not due until the 28th, so that's what another almost two weeks. Uh, Wayne's got a few, the Cons Fund, <laughs> Conservation Commission Fund, some land acquisitions, uh, Broadway Coalition coming in perhaps with something else, uh, Miss Flo's Diner for the sign maybe, um, and uh, National yeah. Historic Register thing for someone else. But all these are tentative, nothing has come in, but there will be a, a few I think fewer than we are used to, but a few projects coming in. Last but not least on my chair's report, we would like to re-welcome um, George, what's your name again, George? Uh, you just said it. Kohau. Kohau, thank you. Uh, who is our representative now from planning, who puts up to our full contingent of nine members. Uh, George was a member of the CPC 
2006 to 2009 or 10. So we are welcoming him back uh, with his knowledge, not just of planning, but also how we work. So that's so that's a nice thing. So welcome, George. Thank you, Brian. Anything you want to share with us about your? No, I'm self? excited. Just like you said, I mean, it's just a treat to drive around the city and and see all the things that have happened due to the CPA here in Northampton. Um, and unfortunately, sometimes the things that haven't happened, but really the, the way that we've been able, um, and this committee's been able to pour some money out to some really great things. Okay. Good. Well, thank you for joining us again. Okay, Stuart uh, Sagnor is the Executive Director of the Community Preservation Coalition and has come all the way from Boston. Is that right, that we live? Yes. Oh, I live in uh, Northern Mass, but I was at the office today, our office is in Boston. Boston. Wow. So thank you for coming. All right, I'm presenting to it. Great. I'm going to stand over here, Brian, okay. so everyone can watch the screen and see me at the at the same time. The no. There's no. Oh no, it's not. It's only the top percent It's only for the camera. Right. It's only for the camera. Right. Everyone good? Yeah. All right. Great. Well, thanks so much for having me. Um, as uh, Brian mentioned, I'm the director of the Community Preservation Coalition. We are in Boston. I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we do tonight. Um, the reason um, Brian and Sarah arranged for me to come out is you folks have made a decision last year not to join the coalition. We fund ourselves mostly through membership dues from community preservation committees. And um, uh, Brian thought it would be a good idea to come out and give everyone a little bit of perspective of what we do. It seemed like um, perhaps the committee wasn't aware of exactly what we do. And um, as I looked through the roster, I realized that all the folks that I had worked with in the past and knew on the committee were no longer on the committee. So I'd never met um, any of you before. So kind of natural that maybe you didn't know a little bit about what we do. And so I thought this was, I thought that was a great idea. And I decided um, to put together a presentation to give you guys a good perspective of what we do. Happy to do this interactively as well. We've got about 45 minutes, and um, so if you want to ask questions along the way or make comments or that sort of thing, uh, please do. Uh, it works much better if we do it interactively. And I'm looking to get also some feedback from you folks. Um, if you've been on the committee for a while and have been reading our newsletter, looking at our website, watching uh, what we do at the State House, et cetera, I'd love some feedback on, on uh, what your reaction has been to the things that we do as well. So. Again, thanks so much for having us. We have a pretty long history with, um, with Northampton. We've worked um, very closely with all the chairs you had, starting with Jack Horner and Frank Volkman and um, Catherine Baker and uh, Downey, of course, and, um, and right from the very beginning with, uh, with Paul Spector. Um, we'll talk a little bit about how we got involved with starting CPA. Um, our organization is a nonprofit uh, based in Boston, but we're really just a combobulation of all these other nonprofits uh, we have a 15-member steering committee, and Bob is um, on the steering committee as one of the four members from the uh, CP that doesn't work on a TV screen, so we'll skip that. Um, from the four communities that we have, uh, we have four CPC members from Hatfield, Nantucket, Newton, and um, Templeton in the uh, northern part of the state. Uh, some at-large members, and then a person from each of these other nonprofits sits on the steering committee as well, and these folks guide the. Uh, operation, the budget, the legislative work, um, the programming, and all the things that we do. And the steering committee meets quarterly, and Bob uh, schleps out to Boston from uh, Hatfield, where he's been the longtime chair since the beginning, right? You're the only chair That's Hatfield right. has ever had. Yeah. Um, and um, we just had our meeting in December. We'll meet again uh, in March. And these organizations are pretty active um, on our steering committee as well. They help us at the State House. They help us with presentations out in the field. They help us with uh, policy and planning and projects uh, in lots of the CPA communities. I don't know if you've ever been involved with any of these organizations, but it's very possible they've uh, been involved in projects in your community. I know that the uh, Trust for Public Land was uh, very involved in um, uh, what happened in Florence with the fields and uh, Clem Clay, who was the project manager at TPL, was the main person behind that uh, whole project and working with the city to get that all protected. So uh, that's at least one organization I know it's been very involved with you. The things we do, I think, are typical of, for lack of a better word, a nonprofit uh, municipal trade association. Every different town and uh, board has a trade association. Uh, you have one of the planning, uh, planning board, the planning association. Um, who's the CONSCOM person? Has MACCD. Um, there's even a, a moderators association, a lawyers association. 
every board or committee really has one. And um, we're the one for uh, community preservation committees in the state. Um, so technical assistance is a big part of what we do. We answer about 4,000 questions by either email or telephone uh, throughout the year. Uh, it's a pretty busy office, you can imagine, with, with um, 4,000 calls coming in. And there's um, uh, just four of us in the office, and, and not everyone is full-time either. So we're pretty pretty lean and mean operation. So we rely pretty heavily on our steering committee members and the volunteer work and the help that they give us. Um, we run a website, which I'll uh, show you in a quick second, because that's a pretty uh, good resource, especially anyone new on the committee, less than a year. <coughs> Okay, great, so you've had some good experienced people here. Um, everyone should be getting our newsletter, I hope. Sarah keeps us up to date on your email addresses. Um, and we try to send out bulletins on things that happen immediately when the state match is announced or with uh, court cases and things like that. Probably our most valuable thing that we do, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about that tonight because it's a key thing that's happening right now at the State House, is our advocacy and our work on the legislation uh, from the beginning of CPA till now. Uh, the coalition was actually formed uh, in the 90s and was the group that actually uh, got CPA passed at the state level. And a gentleman named uh, Bob Duran, who is still our legislative agent at the State House, was the one who thought of the idea of CPA and uh, filed the first legislation and then pulled together all those organizations who then formed the coalition and lobbied the legislature to get it passed, which took about a decade or so. Uh, and then the coalition formally um, incorporated as a nonprofit, they all kicked in money and um, we started talking to communities about adopting it. Uh, we help communities with adoption. Um, at any time the program is challenged, we have either a surcharge reduction or um, in only three cases in the whole Commonwealth um, with a revocation vote. And one of those revocation votes was, was right here in uh, Northampton and we were very involved with that. And then the various trainings that we do, conferences, webinars, workshops, and that sort of thing. Uh, we get our funding from three sources. By far the largest is the dues that all the CPA communities pay. It's voluntary. Um, you don't have to pay them. Um, we're very lucky and very um, privileged that uh, about 99% of all the 175 CPA communities in the state do join and see value in joining the coalition. And we're very happy that um, they see that value and, uh, and keep us going. Without that, we wouldn't be able to obviously exist. Um, about 20% of our funding comes from um, traditional grants that we apply to at foundations, uh, and then the nonprofit partners as well help us out with both in-kind um, and uh, filling out, rounding out the budget as well. Um, Bob has a copy of our just completed yesterday um, uh, annual report, and it has a copy of our budget on there as well, so we'll pass that out and you guys can uh, take a peek at that. Um, it has a budget on there. I will tell you that last year we switched fiscal years till July 1st, which matches your fiscal year. We always had an odd fiscal year that started in March. So that budget is actually a 15 month budget. So it's higher than normally our regular yearly budget would be. Uh, and that will be our regular 12 year budget from now on. So I wanted to just quickly tell you about our website because we're pretty excited about it. Um, it's brand new. We just launched it about three weeks ago. Um, we've worked on it for well over a year. Um, and uh, it's a terrific resource. And it is the only resource. Um, you can spend hours and hours and hours on the Commonwealth of Massachusetts website. And um, you'll probably, if you're lucky, be able to find your way to the one page on CPA on the entire state website. It's on DOR's page. It's got a little bit of current information on the trust fund and a bunch of old, outdated information and nothing else. Um, it's pretty skimpy. And beyond that, you won't find anything on the state's website on CPA. There's no one at the state who has CPA in their job title. There's no state department for CPA. There's no one you can call with for questions. There's um, it's not a state function. They consider it to be a local program. Uh, so they don't support it in any way except for managing the trust fund and taking the money in every month, investing it, and then doling it out once a year. Um, the municipal finance unit, uh, the legal unit there does answer all the municipal finance questions in the whole Commonwealth. So they will answer some CPA finance questions. Um, they don't do it in writing anymore. They only do it by telephone. They've been cut, hit with so many cuts and early retirements that they've stopped giving written opinions, um, and they really do it only on the financial part of CPA. 
So for, for good or bad, um, we fill that void. Uh, people think we're a state agency all the time um, and that we're funded by the state budget and that we're part of the state government um, because we function that way. Every other state program has a state agency that answers questions and helps run the program and advocate for the program and educates people on the program and maintains a website with information. There's nothing like that in the state of Massachusetts for CPA. They don't spend a penny on the overhead of the Community Preservation Act. So this website really is critical. Um, we're the keepers of all the data on CPA. Uh, I can't tell you how many times DOR has called us looking for background data on CPA. Lisa Juskowitz, who does the trust fund, actually sends the distribution spreadsheet to us to check every year because we have the best database on, on CPA background in, in history. Um, so I encourage you to spend a lot of time. Anyone been to the new website yet that just debuted last month? Take a peek. Um, I think you'll find that there's a ton of great information on there. And if you do get there, particularly go to this little tab called Technical Assistance. This larger menu comes up and there are literally hundreds of articles and samples and um, downloadable copies of what other communities have been doing that you're more than welcome to borrow, beg, borrow, and steal. We all share things and that's a role we play is taking the best information from all the other communities, putting it up here so everyone can share. We're kind of all in this together. Uh, we all share that trust fund for sure. And so we try to facilitate all the best and um, knowledge that's out there and the best practices that are out there. Um, and most of it for you folks is particularly found on this page. So it looks nicely small and organized there. Dig in and you'll find there's just an unbelievable amount of information, really 20 years of information. We've never really taken anything off. It's very well organized, but there's a ton of stuff on there that I think you'll be very pleased with um, uh, in doing any sort of research or learning more about uh, CPA, I encourage you to do that um, anytime you can. Um, I wanted to just quickly tell you um, a little bit about what's happening with CPA before I delve into a little bit more about um, what we do and how we support you folks because there are some things happening at the state level that will impact you and have impacted you already and that we're working on right now. Um, first of all, CPA, um, have had a huge success with it here in Northampton, but it's been a huge success across the state too, more than I think anyone ever would have imagined. Um, we are up to exactly half the cities and towns in the Commonwealth, 175 cities and towns have CPA. Uh, there were three more that adopted last year. It's very small communities, Plainville, Berlin, and Northbridge all adopted last year, bringing the total to 175, which is exactly 50% but it actually represents 60% of the state's population. Uh, and that's because we've picked up a lot of big cities in the past few years. Cities really had not um, found the magic of CPA. You were one of the exceptions. Um, there were a few cities in the early part of CPA, um, but by and large, the cities have a tougher time adopting CPA and have only recently uh, come on board, which is why the numbers have really skyrocketed in terms of CPA. Um, just in the past couple of years, um, Pittsfield and, and Holyoke out in this area uh, adopted CPA in uh, 2016. Stuart, I can't quite see what the legend is for the gold. Sure, the gold are cities. So cities. you're in gold and the, and the green are, um, are towns. So we actually just started breaking out that way because the cities had proliferated so much we wanted to show. And the, and the legislature was very interested in cities. They really were not too keen about making any changes to CPA or providing any more funding for CPA because it was primarily a um, suburban and more wealthy suburban um, program. And so that was a real problem when we went to the legislature uh, early on and, and asked for changes to the program that would benefit it or more funding for the trust fund. And their response was, until more cities come into the fund, you know, we're gonna be loath to beef up CPA because it's really not an equitable program. Um, so there were a lot of changes made to the program in 2012 that really benefited cities in terms of the uh, recreation opportunities that were able to be done and freeing up the um, recreation and open space money to be used a little easier because although you have a lot of open space to protect, some of the more urban cities don't. So they're able to use the reserve account for both parks, playgrounds, and open space and some other changes. And it's worked exactly uh, as it intended, and the legislature has opened up the pocketbook a little bit more for CPA, as you'll see in a minute. Um, and a 
allowed some uh, great changes to happen to the program as well that communities have, uh, have asked for. So it's a pretty good success story. Um, but all that success has uh, brought about a problem with the trust fund. We're really sort of a victim of our own success because the way CPA is structured and the trust fund is structured, uh, the more communities that join, the more communities share in that pie at the trust fund, and the slices get thinner. Um, does everyone know where the trust fund derives its money? Because it's pretty pe commonly people think it comes from the state budget. Um, and by and large, it does not. Um, as a matter of fact, in the statute, there's nothing that comes from the state budget. It actually comes from a special fee uh, that was added onto registry filing fees. In 2000, when Governor Salucci signed CPA, there was a new $20 surcharge on filings at the registry all over the state. Uh, municipal lien certificates are $10, but the balance of documents are 20. Um, initially, that brought in a flood of money when the real estate market was really hot in 2003 and 2004. Uh, the very first year, the trust fund uh, brought in $53 million. If you think about how many $20 individual pieces of paper were filed with the registry to bring in $53 million, it's incredible. Um, and everyone got a 100% match. And there was actually a, a balance that built up of $125 million, um, which allowed that 100% match to last for six years. Um, unfortunately, when the legislature sees a pile of money sitting there, what do they want to do? They want to grab it for every other state program. So my predecessor, Dory Pazella, there's only been two executive directors. Dory was there until 2006, and I've been there since. Poor Dory spent from 2004 to 2006 fending off about 20 raids on the trust fund, everything from milk pricing support to the Help for Women and Abused Children program, to um, rail, um, rail improvements. I mean, anything that you could think of that had nothing to do with CPA, that $125 million balance was a, a tempting target for the legislature. And luckily, we were able to um, work um, at the State House pretty hard to keep um, that money in the fund, which allowed for six years of that 100% uh, match. And, um, but then it began falling pretty rapidly as the program expanded and as the real estate market went down and as refinancings went down, because interest rates went down, no one's refinancing really anymore. Um, everyone who could really has. And so the trust fund revenue has been cut in half. It now brings in about $24 million as opposed to 53. But the number of communities has skyrocketed. So from 100%, we're down to 13.8% this year as a, as a base match. Um, communities that adopt at 3% get a little more, but you folks are at less than 3%, so you always get the base match. No, we're not. We're at 3%. You're at 3? Yeah. Oh, you must be the only city in the, in the Commonwealth that's at 3. So that's terrific. Um, so you do get, what'd you get this year? Somewhere in the 20s? Uh, the 22? Yeah. Well, well, that makes one, sense. Yeah. Right. Okay, so um, that's terrific. I don't think I don't know if too many cities have been able to adopt a three. I know Cambridge is a three, but there's a, 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 a special case there, but it might be the only other one. Okay, so um, we saw that obviously that trend coming, and in 2007 we began working with the legislature to try to address the funding at the trust fund. And um, although we have not been able to get them to raise the fee, which is our goal, we have been able to get to get them to. Um, uh, put state surplus money toward CPA. And it's totaled $56.4 million so far. So they have really shown um, their love for the program and their appreciation for the program by continually, um, when they can, and as we push each year, uh, putting money toward the program, including $10 million this year. So that brought the base match up to 19 and then your 3% match brought it up a little bit more into the into the 20% range. Uh, but we have to work very hard every year for that surplus money because it's not automatic. You have to start the process now. Um, we're lobbying the governor right now to put it in his budget, which will come out in a couple weeks. I think we'll be successful in having him put $10 million in again for this year uh, into his budget. Then we have to work with the House and the Senate and the conference committee, et cetera. So there's that trend on the state match. The green are the four years we've been successful in getting um, trust fund money, which adds up to $56 million. The little red dots are the climbing number of communities, um, which we're now up to, uh, the, we're up to 
We're at 172 now. Those three new communities, although they adopted, won't start with the program until next year, until FY 2020. Stuart, what explains that 2013 spike? That year, we got 25 million in surplus money. So that was the year that we passed that big piece of legislation that had all those comprehensive changes to CPA. And we were able to convince the legislature that expanding the recreation category and making it a little easier for cities to come into the program, that we needed a lot of money to help pay for that. We didn't want um, the existing communities to be hurt by that. So we were able to get a big chunk of money that year to help offset the um, changes that were made. So it really, it actually doubled everyone's match that year. And for 3% communities, it actually more than doubled it because the match would have been somewhere around that, you see it had been pretty steady at about 27%. It would have been somewhere around 26% actually that year. So it, um, it about doubled it that year with the, with the 25 million that we got. So we got um, 25 million, 11.4, 10, and then 10 again this year. That brought it to the 19. Okay, sorry, <coughs> skipped one. Um, so our, our focus this year and what I was doing all day today before I came here was up at the State House is um, refiling our bill so we can get a permanent increase in that $20 fee. It's never been adjusted. Um, so far we've been unable to get the legislature to do that. They've chosen to do the surplus money, um, but um, you know we would like them to take that original funding source and it hasn't been adjusted in 20 years and make that adjustment so we don't have to every year beg, borrow, and steal for surplus money. There's not always a surplus. The past two years there wasn't. This year there was. Who knows what it'll be next year? Um, and frankly, you know, it's not enough. I mean, we went from 13% to 19%. Um, we'd like to see it, you know, well above 30% at least. Um, and so the surplus is never going to have that kind of money in it. So raising the deeds fee is the best solution. Um, and uh, today we were up there finalizing the language and um, we have working with a brand new sponsor, Representative Kulik, who's been our sponsor in the past, retired. Um, so Representative Ferrante from Gloucester is our new uh, House sponsor and Senator Cream is continuing on the Senate side. We've gotten the Senate to pass that bill twice each of the last two years, uh, but unfortunately when it's gone into conference, the House has not agreed to. So the House is our issue. The governor has never um, signaled exactly what he'd do, but we've been working on him, you know, very uh, hard over the past the four years. And um, at a housing conference in late November, um, we uh, planted a question with one of our housing partners at the conference, and we asked him about that um, uh, bill, and um, he was certainly aware of it because we had made him aware of it um, many, many times. And he said if the legislature sends it to his desk this session, he will sign it, which was terrific um, because that's a great signal to the legislature that he's not going to veto it. And that's, a, that's important for the legislature to know that. The last thing they want to do is have to take an override vote on a, a fee increase bill that puts the spotlight on it. They don't want to do that. So knowing that the governor is going to sign it is a, tr is a terrific victory for us. Um, and you might have seen that spread all over the news because we um, hired a we hire we have a PR person that we hire periodically and we put him to work and you might have seen it was all in your newspapers we had an editorial in the Globe we had editorials in tons of papers we had an op-ed that we wrote and distributed to many papers that ran in actually your paper as well so yeah how how, how far does this get in the house is it taken up by the house or is it just just die in committee or? no we get we get it through the committee is the speaker um, the problem are we on camera <laughs> yes, yes. yes we are <laughs> so if we're on camera um i really usually don't talk about the intimate details of what happens at the house um frankly i'll be very honest with you you really never know why you don't get it very far at the at the legislature okay. it's very hard to discern exactly what's going on um, behind the scenes because they have 6,000 bills um, you know and maybe two three hundred maybe four hundred at the most might pass half of those are going to be what they call sick bank bills every time someone has to get a, a, a long-term uh, sick leave of absence they have to pass a bill so there's maybe 200 real bills that pass the rest do not 
Right. So you're not going to be able to get detailed information on why 5,200 bills don't pass. So um, it is it is difficult. I know that we have tremendous support. We hustle around the building every session to get co-sponsors. We have 126 co-sponsors last time. Um, so uh, you know it is a tough vote. It's a fee increase, and that's a hard vote. They don't take those lightly. Yeah. How much of an increase is it? Is How it much? going from twenty dollars to well it's forty dollars or? $20 to $5 or? Well, if you can think about it, at $20, we bring in about $24 million. It varies every year, which gives us now a 13% match. So if we wanted to, if we were happy with 26%, it would have to go to $40. Um, but then it's going to start dropping again. As soon as you hit that amount, it's going to start dropping again because your taxes go up every year. Your local revenue from CPA goes up every year. You've probably doubled your revenue since 2007 because it incrementally goes up. So we'd like to get it into the mid-30s so that it'll stay above 30% for quite a while. Once we get this one-time adjustment, we can't go back and ask again. It's going to be quite a while before we'll get another adjustment. The original version of the bill did have an indexing feature where it would self-adjust according to inflation. Uh -huh. um, if any of you remember, the state passed a gas tax increase a few years ago that was immediately repealed by the voters at the ballot. Anything with an indexing feature is now dead on arrival at the House. They will not pass anything that is indexed any longer. Um, so we get one shot at it. Um, <coughs> well, I mean, the real thing driving the match down is I mean, partly what you're saying about property taxes, there's also Austin and Springfield and big cities coming in. Correct. So, yeah, although we were. Do we think that's like. The we had a lower match long before Boston came in. Boston is not the problem. I mean, we had. We were we were down into the low, low 20s before Boston even came on the scene. Boston, Boston take in like equal property taxes to like the rest of the CPA communities combined? I guess it well, Boston went past at 1%. So, okay. we. Boston reduced everyone's match by about 18% each community. So it, we would have gotten, you know, instead of 13.8, whatever, adding 18%, it's still pretty low. I guess my question is, are there any other high population communities who are thinking about approving um, CPA? Uh, well, we've got half the communities now. Right. Um, Worcester looked at it this year and passed on it because the match is so low. So I, we don't see a lot of interest in CPA at all right now. We're, we're never proactive on adoption. We were back between 2000 and 2006, let's say, because otherwise no one would have adopted if we didn't go out and explain it to people. Since, since about 2006, all we've done is be reactive. When a community calls us and they're interested in the presentation, we'll go out and explain it to them. Um, but we don't get many adoption calls at all these days because the match is so low. Uh -huh. So, but it will still drop every year, even if no one new adopts, because the local surcharge goes up in every community. Um, so that's our focus this year, and, and you'll hear a lot more about that from our newsletter and our, our emails to you. Hey, Stuart, yeah. I might I might just jump in. So all of you probably knew that Peter Coca and Stan Rosenberg, uh, prior to becoming Senate President. Um, Stan and Peter were both very, very strong supporters of CPA. Stan had to sort of step back a little bit as Senate President, but um, uh, Stewart knew that I, I would, if I, if there was something that we needed him to know about, I could, I could actually text him and he would get back to me and say, "Yeah, I'm, I'm following it." I'm, you know, so to the extent that he needed to retain the position, you know, some, some. Uh, distance because of his position as Senate President, he was still extremely supportive of CPA. So we now have two, you know, new members of the delegation. Uh, and I know that Joe and Lindsay probably both are, uh, you know, very knowledgeable on CPA <coughs> and I would assume support it. But to the extent that you all can, um, you know, work <coughs> with them, just as Brian said earlier, you know, making them fully aware of everything it's done for Northampton. We're actually going to be helping Lindsay with a farm tour in Hatfield, and she was uh, present at a meeting we had recently. We talked about CPA there. Um, so, you know, all of us in the, in their respective districts um, should do what we can uh, because with P Peter and and then Steve Kulik, I mean, we our part of the 
state lost three very, very important people who were, particularly as it came to CPA, just real lions, champions uh, for the program. So we need to rebuild that, uh, that, uh, that level of uh, commitment. All three of those were key for us, and the stand was the reason we passed it in the Senate. Uh, Steve was our longtime sponsor, and Peter would always file our bill as a budget amendment in the House and try to get it passed in the House. So those three were actually three of our key legislators. Um, so, so I just wanted to give you a little idea of what Northampton has received from the surplus money, what your percentage of that money has. So from the four times we've received um, that $56 million, you've gotten an extra $534,000 from the surplus money. Um, so, and this year it added up to about 79,000. And I show you that because I do want to explain a little bit about uh, what we do as the coalition. Um, this, this money doesn't, the legislature doesn't just decide, hey, let's give <coughs> some money to CPA. It takes years of work on Beacon Hill. We're up there every week, sometimes every day of every week, talking to legislators, meeting with them, showing them data, uh, explaining CPA, explaining the issues. Um, and it takes a ton of time to shake loose $56 million from the legislature. They don't just uh, give it out. So that work um, uh, takes a long time, as I said, and it takes funding. I mean, we have uh, two lobbyists who we work with, Bob Duran and uh, Christian Scorzoni. We have marketing and PR folks, and we have our, our staff. Um, so it does take uh, funding to do that, and our funding does come from you, but it returns uh, a tremendous investment, we think. Um, so, um, half a million dollars is a pretty good return on your investment, we think, um, on the dues, and that's why most communities do feel like their investment in the coalition is a, is a pretty good investment. Um, you received an extra $80,000 last year. You didn't join the coalition. We hope you will join this year um, and, uh, and be a part of us. And, CPA is pretty much um, uh, integral to what we do for Northampton. Uh, Northampton is all over our website. Your photos are all over our website. Your photos are all over our social media. Um, your examples of things you've done are all over our technical assistance pages. Um, we've been involved for a long time with uh, what Northampton has done. And uh, I can't imagine uh, actually not working with Northampton um, in the future because of so much we've done with you folks. Um, Another thing we do that we usually can't talk about on camera, or talk about it all, frankly, is the defensive work we do on Beacon Hill. Every session there are tons of bills that are filed that would change CPA in a way that is not beneficial to you. They're usually filed by communities that don't have CPA, that want to tap into the trust fund, or change it in some way, or expand it you know, to many other pet projects in other communities. Um, these are some of the ones filed last time. One of these would have um, expanded CPA to market rate housing. Another would have changed the distribution formula to favor the big cities out east. Um, another would have diluted the fees collected at the registry for other things. Another would have made you revote on CPA every five years automatically. It would expire and you'd have to revote it. Um, and then, of course, those raids on the trust fund, they, they actually still keep coming back, even though there's no money in the trust fund. That one's not too hard to kill anymore because there's no money in the trust fund. But uh, we, they, legislators kind of keep <coughs> filing bills over and over again. They just pull last sessions and they didn't pass it and file them again. Um, and these are just some of the numbers from the last session of bills that we have to go up there and um, you know explain to folks why they shouldn't pass. And knock on wood, we've never had a negative bill pass on CPA. On the other hand, we've had uh, nine amendments to the Act, and these all have been tremendous changes that communities have asked us to make. Our members actually submit ideas all the time of what they'd like to do with CPA. We work very hard on those. Um, it takes a lot to pass a bill. It took us five years to pass that 2012 bill, the main feature of that bill being the recreation changes. So have you, I mean, you did uh, Pulaski Park, right? You would not have been able to do that project <coughs> if that bill hadn't passed. So we worked on that for five years on your behalf and on behalf of all the CPA communities, um, lobbying at the legislature and convincing them that that was a good change. It was not easy um, because they remember that in the beginning we promised CPA wouldn't be used on existing assets, it would only be used for new things, new parks, um, but that wasn't happening so we, we had to get, show them the data on that and, uh, and convince them. 
Um, have you ever done anything with historic um, artifacts? A clock, I think you had a clock that you did, or a curtain, some things like that I've seen in the database. Again, that was added in 2006, artifacts and um, documents. I don't know if you've done any document work. Um, we worked on that in 2006 to get that added to the program. In fact, every single one of your historic projects wouldn't have been possible with CPA uh, because the act was originally passed, curiously enough, and it said you couldn't work on your historic buildings unless you had acquired them or created them with CPA funds. So you would have had to build your town hall, your city hall with CPA funds in 1852 or whatever it was in order to be able to fix it up. I don't know how CPA passed that way, but it did. And we had to go back and fix that in the next session. And it took the whole session to get that, to get that done. Um, so um, that was um, uh, the very first change. Chapter 165 of the Acts 2002. Clarify that CPA funds could actually be used to rehabilitate historic resources. Um, and you can look through these. We have all these on the website, and then when you click on them, all the background data on the change and why it was necessary and the language that we wrote and all that is, is on there. Um, our involvement with you folks actually goes back to 2003. Um, this is a press release I found in our files with my predecessor, Chris Zaccardi, who was the associate director, came out and did a presentation on CPA in 2003. Um, this was the very first time CPA was um, uh, thought about in Northampton. We came out and did a presentation to see if there was any interest out here. Um, and Chris actually sent out this press release with that horrible, horrible logo we had back then. <laughs> um, and from that, uh, a committee did form. Um, and uh, Councilor Spector was a big part of that committee. And George, you said you were involved with that. Um, and uh, Jack was involved in that. And, some, and uh, Lily, I think you said, was involved with that as well. Um, <coughs> And uh, that led to the adoption in, in 2012. Um, so in summary, we've worked you know, for your community for a long time on CPA. Um, we, we have funded your efforts. We actually had, uh, we don't have any more, but we did up until a couple years ago, had a separate fund of money that we raised to donate to communities when they're running adoption campaigns. So we donated a couple thousand dollars to your campaign committee in 2005. Uh, and then when you were facing revocation, um, we donated again to the committee that was formed to, um, uh, to fight the revocation uh, with CPA. So we've actually contributed from our, that separate fund that we had. We don't use dues for that. We can't use public money for that. We raise private donations for that fund um, that we donate uh, for adoption and revocation efforts. Um, and uh, we worked very closely, obviously, with the committee that adopted CPA and then the committee that um, uh, handle the revocation efforts. Um, obviously the, the work we've done on the trust fund um, and protecting those harmful pieces from getting passed. Um, we've had uh, many communities that have faced the same revocation challenges um, and reduction challenges. We've only gone to the ballot three times, but this is one year when there were, th one year there was 35, it's on two separate spreadsheets, 35 legislative body votes to either revoke or reduce CPA in 2008 when the recession hit. 17 in the spring and 18 in the fall. And we worked on every single one of those. When communities called and said, we got a problem, we, we, we come to the rescue and really help them um, you know, with their strategy and their materials and that sort of thing. Um, uh, luckily, we don't have too many of those now, but we do have them. There are three coming up this spring right now that we're working on. And of course, you had your revocation piece too that we helped well, uh, with. Um, so, um, and then on and on. So I know our time is short, and so um, I think I've probably said enough, and I do want to leave a couple seconds for any questions that folks might have, or definitely get your feedback on what your concerns were and whether we've maybe allayed some of the questions that you had on, uh, on the coalition and, and what we do. Thank you so much, Stuart. Uh, questions for Stuart folks have? Are you sharing this with Sarah, your presentation. Yeah, you want me, want me to email it to you tomorrow? Sure. Yeah. I think it would be useful. Yeah. I can do that tomorrow morning. Yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah. I'm actually going to another CPA committee tomorrow. I'm doing a present training down in Dighton. Um, but I can call Chase back in the office and he can, uh, he can email it to you. So, any, um, what were some of the concerns, if, my, if I could ask on when you folks voted not to join, what were some of the concerns and did this, did this help at all? I think this, uh, 
for me, uh, this helps enormously. I think a lot of your work, I mean, you live it on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, it's pretty invisible to us. And we try with the, the newsletter and the website. Um, everyone's busy, and I know a lot of folks, I mean, we can, we can see on the newsletter, I get a ton of them. You know, I can't read them all from all the organizations I belong to, and, you know, we have about 2,500 people on our mailing list, and maybe, you know, seven or 800 might open a, a newsletter and see what we're doing and what's going on. It's hard. Um, you know, we post all that on our website, and we, we now have anyone a follower on our Twitter or Facebook feeds. We pump out a ton of information on that, but it's tough. You know, everyone's busy and everyone's involved in a lot of different organizations, so it's it's hard to, if we have a, anyone suggest a better way for us to get the information out, we'd love to know, but it is tough to communicate everything we're doing. And frankly, some of the things in the State House, we can't communicate, we just can't. It's very hard to- well, I think the historic perspective of, of the role of the coalition through it from, from the inception throughout right. is, uh, is really helpful because if you just focus on, you know, so what's happening today without right. an appreciation of uh, what's coming before, <coughs> you, you, you lose a lot. So I don't, know, I don't know how to do that other than your presentation when I'm sure you don't want to visit all 175 communities. <laughs> I've been there. Um, no, we, we, yeah. go, we go to 30 or 40 or maybe even 50 every year. Um, we really, we love to get out in the field and do trainings and presentations and that's the only way we can figure out what communities need and what what's, uh, best practices are and gather great ideas to share with others. So um, we're out all the time. Well then put us on a three year cycle or something. Okay, I was, I was here in 2015, I think was the last time I was here, so. So, is that right? Uh, Is that right? Okay. <laughs> I can tell you right now, I'll look on my laptop. Any other questions for Stuart? Well, I think, I think this conversation came out of the kind of conversation we have with every single piece of paper that comes from this committee. Is like, is this money going towards something that all the people in Northampton and the property taxes are already don't, uh, yeah. but think this is a good place and it's in the public interest, et cetera, et cetera. And we were unsure. I don't know if other people are still unsure. I don't know. But um, I guess. Uh, my question would be like, what, what, what is the dues structure? And you, is our do all 175 communities pay the same dues? You, I mean, I assume you're making a lot more money now that you have 175 rather than whatever. I mean, could right. So I assume your budget's gotten bigger, uh, but maybe there's more complicated things to do. I don't know. Right. So Sarah, have, Sarah, do you share every year that email that we send you? Okay. So. In that email that we send every year with the invoice and the dues renewal, we send this, mm -hmm. and this has it too, I believe, but um, that email, maybe this doesn't have it on here, but the email that carried this, which mm -hmm. Sarah got today, I think. Um, did you not get it? Oh, well, you're not a member. <laughs> so you wouldn't have gotten a renewal. Um, so, um, but the email Sarah has gotten in the past, which I hope she shared with you, has a link to a membership page. Mm -hmm. And that talks all about our membership program and it has the chart of all the dues. Mm -hmm. So we actually copied um, MACC's. Did you say you're MACC? Who was the yeah. cards count person? Yeah. yeah, we copied MACC's membership model. Mm -hmm. So there are eight dues categories. And the way MACC set it up, we thought was great. Um, everyone pays the same percentage. Um, they do it on population. We do it on a percentage of your local surcharge revenue. Um, because population doesn't make any sense. We have some tiny communities that are that have high property values mm -hmm. that are at 3% mm -hmm. that get a lot more money than Springfield, which is a huge city. So the eight categories categorize everyone by how much local revenue they receive, and then everyone sits, uh, pays between 3 tenths and 7 tenths of 1% or the 3 one hundredths and 7 one hundredths of 1% of their local surcharge. So everyone's in that same range in those eight categories. Um, so they range from Gosnold, which um, pays, I think, $200 because they generate $5,000 a year in total from CPA, um, up to the only community in the very high range is Boston, which is, they joined this year for the very first time because they're brand new and they pay $20,000. Um, so it's, it's based on, basically our work is mostly on the trust fund, on protecting the trust fund and increasing the trust fund. So if we get more money in the trust fund, 
Boston's going to get a bigger share of it. Um, so they pay more to pay for more of our work on that trust fund. So everyone's is scaled appropriately in that. So your dues are $4,350. So whatever category you're in. Um, we have only raised our dues once in 12 years, and we probably will not raise them again uh, for a long time because we do when new communities come in, that sort of helps us with our increases in, in costs. Um, so we really almost never have to raise our dues because of the new communities that come in, although we haven't had any new communities recently. So um, I will also, Sarah, uh, no, she didn't get it today. I will send you that membership page link. I think it's just our website slash membership, but I will I will send that tomorrow to Sarah along with this presentation. If you Google it, it comes up. Yeah. Yeah, if you I think you type in membership on the search box on our website, it'll come up. But I'll send it to you tomorrow morning, Sarah, with our presentation. And um, that page will show it. Okay. Other questions? I just have one other question. Yes. I remember when the coalition was first formed, I believe, and you um, kind of kept a running database of the pro projects that were funded. Mm -hmm. Do you still do that? Oh, yeah. So Is that something a member could access? Oh, it's website? right on the website. Yep. Okay. Um, so um, that's that's one of the things we spend so I, much time on. I know time it's on. a huge <laughs> effort. I'm sure I'm probably also just categorizing them would be really difficult. Yeah, it's it's an enormous undertaking. There's over 11,000 projects now. Yeah. Um, so it's right here. See, it says um, CPA data bank. Mm -hmm. There's a drop down menu, and the third thing on there is projects database. Okay. Um, so from 2000 to 2007, we collected all that data ourselves. Yes. Um, Chris Cardi, my predecessor, would, would get every town meeting vote and every city council vote and put it on a big spreadsheet and get all that information. It became overwhelming as right. we got to 100 communities and there were 10, 15 projects in every community. So we went to the state and said, hey, you know, this is going to be a problem if you have a billion dollar program. and." People ask where's the money gone, and there's no answer to that. Mm -hmm. And our little, we had two people at that point, shouldn't be really the ones that have to do that. Um, so we finally convinced them to put their money into developing a tool to collect that information. Um, we designed the tool for them. We sat on a committee with them for a whole year and um, coached them along. And finally, kicking and screaming, we got them to um, start collecting the data. Um, but they don't want anything to do with it. Um, so we manage that process every year. and We send out the reminders. Chase spends all of July and August, our communications person, <coughs> helping communities get that information in there because the state database is kind of cumbersome and it doesn't work that well. Um, but it is a state database. Um, and then uh, they send us um, the big complicated form that we process and put it up on our website. So it would be updated, say, like late summer then? Would it's updated uh, about uh, end of October. October. The okay. deadline is September 15th that the state puts on everyone getting their projects in. And then it takes them a while to get us the information. And then we put it up on the website by October 30th. Okay. So it does get updated once a year. Great. Thank you. So and it's a great, it's a great resource, yeah. but it, it's a bear to manage. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, we have some housing people who are going to talk to us shortly, so I wonder if that database has cumulative information concerning the percentage in categories. Statewide? Statewide. Um, it does not, but I can kind of tell you. Um, so, uh, I'll, but I have to give you my, my spiel first on that. Um, <laughs> okay. Because some people do ask. Um, the statewide numbers, are sort of meaningless because one of the great benefits of CPA is that communities can do with the money what they want. So in Plymouth, it's all about historic preservation. That's their number one priority. Um, in Cambridge, it's affordable housing. They spend 80% of their money on affordable housing. My little rural town up in Northern Mass never met a piece of open space we didn't want to buy. If a piece of open space comes on the market, we're gonna bond out 20 years and we're gonna buy it. Um, at one point, we were actually bonded out fully for the next 20 years. So that's the great benefit of CPA. And so how the numbers roll up statewide, you know, a lot of the statewide organizations are interested in that, but it really is meaningless because CPA is really only about local choice and what you want to do with the money. 
That being said, I can tell you it's pretty incredible how evenly it is. Mm -hmm. um, historic, I'm sorry, recreation is behind all the others because up until 2012, it was very hard to use that money. Mm -hmm. So uh, housing, I happen to know, is at 28% statewide of the money, of money that's been spent. Um, the bonding is separate because it's impossible to uh, track because the state of the way the state gathers the information, they gather the information of the entire bond of the day it's passed at the legislative body, but you can't tell how much debt service has been paid and how much is gonna be in the future, unfortunately. So the direct spending housing is, is 28%. So but we have, like I said, some communities at 80, at Cambridge, and then we have a lot of communities who are at the bare minimum because they can't figure out how to do it. You know, what's, what's Granville gonna do with their $70,000 that they've mm -hmm. gathered over t 10 years. It's very hard to figure out what to do to get your housing efforts going in a town like Granville, you know, when you have $70,000, so. So who's responsible for checking every year that the town is like putting the money in the right buckets? There's a um, three forms that the state requires, mm -hmm. um, and that's all the, all the data that they submit. Um, the CP1 is the form that your um, assessor sends in every year that says, we raised $532,000 from our local surcharge, send us our match. Very simple form, that's the CP1. The CP2 is your balance statement, showing how much money you spent in each category, um, what your debt service payments were, um, what your reserves were in each of the categories. It asks the accountant to certify that you reserved or spent 10% in each of the categories, and the year-end balances. So do you get a copy of the CP2? The law says actually you're supposed to get a copy of the CP2, so you guys should ask. Um, it's due October 1st, I believe, every year. Um, October 30th, that's the deadline that can be sent to the DOR. It gets sent to DOR. It's filed electronically now. It's not, they call it the CP2 form, but everything's now electronic with DOR, so it's not a paper form anymore. But you absolutely should have a copy of the CP2 every year. That's filed by your um, city accounting department. Um, um, it's not as useful as the financial report. Yeah. Yeah. And the, uh, but it gives you a snapshot at the end of the year. Um, of what DOR has in their database. And then the third form is the CP3, which is actually that project database. And that's it, that's the, that's the reporting for CPA. Any questions for Stuart? Well, thank you right. so much. We Great. really appreciate you coming all the way out here. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks for the opportunity to come talk to everybody. I appreciate that. Yeah. And we'll get back to you. So thank thanks, you. Stuart. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No, I'm going to stay, uh, spend a little money in your town. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next up on the agenda uh, is a discussion with the housing partnership folks, of which I believe perhaps a couple are here. Um, they asked to meet with us regarding um, some of the dynamics with affordable housing uh, and, and, uh, and other issues as well. So without further ado, once Stuart flees with his computer, is that your computer? No, this is, uh, this is your computer. Okay, we don't flee with that computer. No, I'm just gonna leave my, with my zip drive and uh, my remote. So you have two folks here from the Housing Partnership, is that right? Um, right now it's myself, but Todd will be joining probably momentarily. Okay. And perhaps you could introduce yourself yeah. and, and begin. So, good evening. My name is Patrick Bowen. I'm the Vice, Patrick Bowen. I'm the Vice Chair of the Housing Partnership. I live in Florence. I have two little kids, they're four and one. Um, been on the housing partnership for about four years now, and spawned city government a little bit before then. I've been the vice chair for like a year or so. Uh, my area of interest uh, on the housing partnership has uh, been focused a lot on zoning and on housing development. And wanted to say thank you first 
for everybody taking time and inviting us to come talk to you tonight. Um, as another, another member of the volunteer board, I appreciate you all being similarly motivated to spend your time in long civic meetings. Uh, so to start with, I thought it'd be useful to kind of view tonight as like a mutual education opportunity, get to learn a little bit more about how you guys work and what your thoughts are towards housing. And I can provide some background information about what the housing picture looks like in the city in general, um, what the CPA can mean for an affordable project, and in what context about affordable housing in general. So let me get my PowerPoint yes. To begin with, if there's any questions that people have or interests coming into this that I should be mindful of, We're just all in shock that the technology is working. We're yes. <laughs> speechless. That <laughs> all doing as well as, it, as we struggled in the past with some of the computer issues, but tonight it's working so well. Couldn't save the latest version. So Stuart just mentioned statewide is 28 percent number on affordable housing. Does anybody have an off the cuff kind of percentage of what we've spent in the past? I think Patrick probably knows it. Yeah. Um, as of the 2018 form that I got from John Frey, it was 19.3%. Um, it does not include the latest round, is my understanding. Um, so the numbers were shipped a little bit, but I think it's about the same. I think, um, from what I understood from Stuart, they don't include the bond the projects in their calculation. Yeah, we're, we're so 20. that is going to really right. skew things mm -hmm. and make the percentage look mm -hmm. higher. Right. Whereas we do include all mm -hmm. in one year mm -hmm. uh, the bonded projects. So it will look like we have, in a particular year, we may have spent a million dollars on something when uh, that year's contribution might be a fifth of that or a tenth of that, depending on what the length of the bond is. So if they're not quite happy. So for example, Linda, like with Pulaski Park, mm -hmm. that was a big chunk of money mm -hmm. and that would appear all in the year was that's my understanding. Okay. I believe that they're included in the numbers that are this is that financial right. yeah, status spreadsheet that I believe everybody else yeah. here has looked at right. before. Right. So I'm saying that nineteen percent is not you can't really directly compare it to the twenty eight percent that Stuart was talking about. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not necessarily looking to compare it to the statewide average. Um, cause like you said, that varies. Um, um, put in the, this thing here to just illustrate where we are in the different categories as a refresher. I heard it discussed at previous meetings, so it seems like people are aware of it, but generally housing, oh, um, if you go to four categories, then housing is the last of those four, and it's a spread of about 10 percentage points between the lowest and the highest. But Going back to kind of a general overview of housing, and unfortunately one of my slides I added at the last one is missing, but I wanted to start. Um, this is the city as of um, ACS data from 2016. Uh, it's been, so it's fairly recent. But equally divided between owners and renters, so it's slight to towards owners. Half of renters are cost burdened in some fashion. Our cost burden being you're spending 30% more on your property income on housing and severely cost burden that you're spending 50% more of your income on housing. Uh, it's about 20% for owners. So it's about a third of the city overall is cost burden for housing. Um, renters are both more sensitive to trends because there's more turnover in that category and on average renters are have less income and so you're more likely to get in a situation as costs increase that 30% or more is going to housing. <clears throat> and the slide that's missing is, uh, puts this in a slightly different way for young buyers that they define as 18 to 34. In 1980, the average home price in Northampton was 99,000, and now as of 2016, it was 311,000, so it went by three. 
uh, multiple of three, whereas the income average for that age group has gone up three thousand dollars from thirty-three thousand to thirty-seven thousand over the Sorry, same time period. Um, Eighteen to thirty-four, so young home buyers. Um, so it's very different. essentially like there's no incomes have not mm -hmm. kept up. Um, this is another way looking at the housing prices. Uh, this is looking at house costs from 2009 forward and it's gone up 30% since 2013. It's a very steep increase. This is a longer trend line looking from 1987 forward. Northampton along with Hampshire County and Massachusetts have severely increased the cost. So one, first question is why is this happening? And one of the big drivers is that we're not building sufficient housing to meet demand and we haven't been for decades. And that's both a national trend and a state trend and local as well. The data on this slide is from Massachusetts wide. You can see the severe drop off after the 80s in construction. This is another slide looking at house prices going to skip by. It did not look correctly. Um, this is, apologize that slides are not working correctly. So this third from the right one here is for our area of the state and it's looking at different income levels and like temperate, about 10 to 50% brackets from low to high and that have a pretty even spread of where the new working household in households are going to be by income but with our home prices increasing that dramatically it's going to be very difficult for that lower third to find housing. I'm a little lost on that slide to tell you the truth. Yeah, well, unfortunately, there's uh, several pieces from this slide that for some reason didn't translate from my computer to yours. So, um, looking at, this is different areas of the state. This is what it's supposed to say here, and this one is for the Pioneer Valley. And um, the Springfield Hoyo area. And then these different colors would be by income brackets of what they expect in the next 10 to 20 years for new working households by income. And just to give you a sense of what the spread will be of the of the incomes going forward for new households. So it's like a quick overview of the severe pressure we're seeing in our housing um, in terms of lack, lack of supply to meet demand. Um, looking into how do affordable projects get funded. Um, this is, um, a lot of these slides are coming from a presentation that was given uh, last year at the AP Gallery by the Mass Housing Partnership, looking at the specific data from Northampton, but also how do affordable projects get funded. And these are an overview of the different funding sources that go into funding a affordable housing project. You can see it's a very complicated undertaking. A lot of different um, sources, each with their own criteria, applications, deadlines to put in. So it's a very delicate act, and it's part of why affordable capital affordable housing is developed by specific entities because it requires such expertise. And I want to focus here on the LIHTC, which is the Low Income Housing Tax Credit. Um, that is a funds, I think it's 95% of housing, affordable housing projects in the country. Um, it's a tax break that corporations can get by fund, uh, investing in affordable housing. And under the change made in the latest tax cut bill, the value of that tax credit has gone down dramatically because it's, while they didn't change the credit specifically, since they lower the overall corporate rate from 35% to 21%, the savings for the corporation that wasn't previously investing in the LIHTC um, is much less beneficial. I have our staff to go over that later, but I'll come, to, come back to you. And that also impacted the state version of the LIHTC. So those three biggest pieces all just got hit by the tax bill. And so it's making development of portal projects more difficult than it would have been two years ago. Uh, so good, I'll probably right after. Um, 
the estimate is that the, the change from the tax cut bill nationally will reduce about 200,000 fewer units over a decade. In the Massachusetts, that'll mean thousands of less units from the reduced value of that tax credit. So it's making other funding sources more important than they would have been before. Um, wanted to touch on a few other things we had the housing before we got back to talking about CP CPC and specific projects. Um, one other thing you should know is that by uh, census tracts, we live in one of in the most segregated place in the country for Latinos and whites, and we're 22nd for segregation between blacks and whites. And that is a thing we need to work on. And you can, this is, so that's why I wanted to put this map here about race and ethnicity to, to speak to the segregation we have in the valley and as a thing that. In the Pioneer Valley or North Hampton? It's uh, in the Pioneer Valley, including like, basically this area that's shown here, which is PV, PC like coverage error, um, the census tract that those, those numbers are based on, and basically goes from like Warrensburg down to Long Meadow. Actually, yeah. so everything on this map is the census track of is those numbers are based on. And the other thing that I'd like to focus on when we're talking about housing is our other goal as a city and as a state is to reduce our carbon footprint as part of addressing climate change. And I don't see any way to do that without bringing denser housing in large numbers to get people at, get them opportunities to get out of their cars and <coughs> other forms of transit and also build yes. homes that like the general trend on housing is that we have less people living per unit in homes that are bigger than they've ever been and that is not going to be compatible with reducing the, t the two biggest pieces of the pie here non-electric thermal is essentially home heating and 44% is transportation, and that 17% is electrical generation, which is most of where most of our focus for climate change has been so far. And so we're gonna hit the near the 80% of that pie. It has to be fear of how we do, how we build our communities and how we build our housing. Hmm. And looking at, this is over between 1990 and 2010, the percentage change in housing units by community and essentially, not unique to North Hampton, but generally the places that are denser to begin with, but also better off, have less, have built less housing, and so you see more sprawl. So I'm going to read some of the numbers because it's quite hard to see. So North Hampton's at 8%, whereas West Hampton's had a 38% increase in housing, Hadley's had a 30% increase in housing in Belchertown and Southampton are the leaders here at 46% for Belchertown and 47% for Southampton. Yes. I'm sorry, Patrick. I, I, I know this is important information and I don't know what you're telling me. So can you try it again? Yes. He's saying less dense, richer places are growing fast. Um, <coughs> sorry, let me, let me try it again. So that's not quite what I meant. So, it tends to be like places that are more established, like Northampton, we have our downtown, we have our neighborhoods that have been around for right. 50, 100 years, that people are resistant to having things built in those neighborhoods. And what make what is easier for a developer to do is to go to a relatively empty place and build yeah. larger houses, more suburban style, and they'll get less pushback from um, opposed to butters. Um, that generally also correlates with places with more wealth are less likely to build houses. You see more extreme cases in Eastern Mass and in towns like Weston. Uh, you get million dollar homes and very exclusionary zoning. And you can kind of see that lived out in the um, <coughs> older city centers that can better support a more climate conscious development and also allow people to walk to their jobs, which is very helpful if you're lower income as well or bike to your job have not built homes at the same rate as our surrounding communities, so this is color-coded. So North Hampton's at 8%, Belfort Town's at 46 So we're really seeing more of a sprawl development. In which community? As a region. Right, so, I, okay, let me try and ask a, a very direct question. Mm -hmm. What is the 
mean when you compare it to the 35% or whatever it is in Belcher Town? What, what behavior is that showing? Um, it's showing that housing production is not at the same, is at a much higher rate in Belcher Town, which. So they're building a lot more houses than we are? Yes. Okay. Or and they're going well, so they're in, they yeah. don't know that. Well, as a community, not as a CCN-wise. Right, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Right. So Five I, to start I put this slide here to time it right. time to the last sense. focus on oh, climate okay. change. All right. okay. And so if we're looking to support, to reduce those transportation, those housing categories, this is the opposite map that you'd want to see. You'd want to, would like to see more housing production closer in in communities that can get by, um, that can provide people opportunities opportunities to commute in other ways besides cars gotcha. which are fairly okay. expensive. Right. Yep. So Thank related you. to that, not to the length of the slide, but yeah. um, I guess Honiak is a decrease. So how, how is that? I mean, is how to um, be converted or demolished or? Um, converted, demolished, condemned. Um, I don't know how it details as well, but they have a number of large buildings downtown that are now yeah. inhabited. Right. anymore mm -hmm. and, and that, so that would be what it is something yeah. like that yeah that, uh, for cities that have gone through like horse kind of economic change it's actually not uncommon that essentially your city is too big mm -hmm. for your current population and uh, one way to decrease uh, negative outcomes of that is to kind of size your city down so they would not be unique in going reducing their housing units like you see that in Detroit as well yeah, true. Right. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. And then one couple, in the last few slides. Um, so we can see already that I, I did a review for a different part of the city on looking at the last five years of American Community Survey data, which is a um, form of the census that takes place between the census. And what we found is that there's about 500 units that used to be below 1,000 in rent that are now above 1,000. So we can see that movement even uh, in the rental market. And also it shows us by income what people are in the rental market. And that 200 households below 20,000 have left Northampton or 4% of the rental households in the last five years. And they're generally being replaced by people at 75,000 or $100,000 and above. Um, this kind of uh, further in that point that generally people with incomes below 50,000 are leaving North Camp the North Hampton rental market and being replaced with people above 70 or 75,000 and above. So like the city is already changing and it's happening. Um, I'd say like fairly quickly. Looking at, since that's just a like five-year time frame. Mm -hmm. right. So that's background on housing, and then speaking to. CPA and more specifically. Any questions so far? Thoughts? So we talk about these housing starts or housing construction. I wonder how much of a trend it is in Northampton for apartment buildings to be flipped and turned into condos. And do those become housing starts or are they the same unit, so to speak? Um, and they leave the rental market yeah. and they become single homes more or less, right? Yeah, uh, I mean, that, that does happen. I don't have the statistics on that. Um, from talking to Carolyn Mish, it, when, it, when we're talking about development of housing, they're not very attached to the ownership status because it can be very fluid. Mm -hmm. And so even if a project becomes to the planning board as a rental, it could be an ownership by the time it actually comes to and that can flip back and forth. Um, I do know that outside of our affordable projects, which are primarily the, the Lumberyard and Live 155, which Live 155 is a wonderful project, but since it replaced another one, it doesn't, didn't actually move yeah. our stats mm -hmm. very much. Yeah. Um, we only have 10 housing starts a year currently. Um, and also, so going to other statistics, um, for affordable. Low income, 10 low income housing. Uh, no, 10 housing starts total. Uh, 
So outside of affordable housing, uh, which capital affordable which subsidies, and outside of Village Hill, which is a mostly built out development, there's 10 housing starts across the city on a year daily basis, which is a very wow. low number. Um, for affordable housing, the metric that is most important is the subsidized housing inventory, which if you're below 10% under the Chapter 40B law or the SNAB law, um, essentially the developer can come in as long as they're providing the affordable housing, they can bypass most of your regulations. Uh, we're currently at just below, uh, I think it's 11% currently. So, and we'll, that's generally, we've been higher at points in the past, but generally we're just above 10%. We're never very far ahead. Um, we recently had several affordable projects uh, expire, most notably Hathaway Farms had 200 plus affordable units that are no longer on, no longer subsidized. Um, so they're no, not part of that count anymore. Um, we don't anticipate any other large drop-offs based on the expiration dates of the other subsidies. So focusing on, coming back to C CPA, CPC. Um, one of our avenues for, our main avenue as a local body for developing, a, supporting affordable housing with dollars is the CPA. Um, as discussed, anytime, welcome. Um, so I just went over like housing statistics in general, kind of giving that background and we just started talking about CPA. So, so our main avenue in terms of dollars locally is to fund with CPA. Um, and those projects that come before you, most recently the Village Trail Project from the Community Builders and Valley CDC. Um, the dollar values versus the size of the project may seem small, uh, but they are impactful. Uh, with the Bell Show project, as you heard, there is a budget gap, and the $150,000 that was committed is 15% of that gap. If it, were, if it was a larger number, it would have been close that gap further. Um, but one of the key things it does is that shows it when the community voters goes to the state to look, apply for the other grants or to, is it shows the strength of the interest of the community and it does matter how what size those grants are um, when they get compared to other communities they could get compared to what was given in the past like how the village Hill project is getting less funding compared to the previous lumberyard project and so the state may notice that difference and ask why. Um, there's a saying that is common in government circles that don't tell me what your values are, show me your budget and I'll tell you what your values are. And that those dollars speak louder than words. Um, and that the delay on the projects is very impactful. Um, my understanding, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is that until the grants are obtained from the state or the budget gap potentially is closed, the project will continue to be delayed. And every year of delay can increase the cost per project by 10 to 15%. And when you're talking about a $20 million project, that can quickly essentially cover up, uh, like if CPA is to grant that in multiple cycles. The grant from the first cycle will be essentially erased by the inflation of the costs in between the two cycles. Um, any questions at this point? There's more things I can talk about, but it's happy to engage in this as a conversation more than a presentation. Do you time. have a uh, specific ask or request to us? Um, one, I'm interested in hearing people's thoughts on housing and how they view it as they weigh the different projects. Um, one, I wanted to 
point out that housing is a very different animal than the other categories, uh, particularly compared to open space and recreation. These projects are not gonna come every cycle, they're not gonna come as often. Um, it's just the nature of their, their, as you saw with that chart, they're very complex to do. Um, one thing I, there's a different ways to go about it. One is to increase the set aside percentage as an option that other communities have done. 10% uh, is the state minimum. You're allowed to go higher than that if you want and then that would potentially bank funds for when you get uh, a housing project or multiple housing projects as you did I think two or three cycles ago there was Sergeant House and a few others in from Habitat for Humanity that all kind of the rain came at the same time. So you could bank funds on the idea the recognition that housing behaves differently in the other categories. Um, you could also look to do bonding. Uh, housing is the only category for Northampton's history that has not had a project bonded for it from CPA. Um, open spaces had Florence Fields. Recreation had Pulaski. Historic had Forbes Library. But housing doesn't have an equivalent so essentially like for each of those, I feel as view those as like each category has their like signature project and that was deemed to, bonded. To jump in with that, it's not possible, unfortunately. It's not legally allowable to bond for a non-city owned affordable housing project. So if the housing authority came in with a uh, with a new with a proposal for a, a new building that could potentially be bonded, but uh, the CPC isn't allowed to bond for the project of a nonprofit. Is that what the bonding and the other parts of the state has been for? I I don't know. I, it's right. it's not an eligible bonding purpose. Okay. As I looked up, there is um, fifteen million dollars that's been bonded across the state for housing um, from C other CPAs. It would have to be city owned. Okay. And and it may it may have been that there are other opportunities okay. in the eastern part of the state. So if that's the case, then probably the better option would be to essentially bonded in advance through the banking process. If you're banking more money between, uh, in the cycles that you don't have a housing project in, in front of you, that it would have potentially this, a similar effect. And do you have a suggestion of changing that percentage from 10% to? Um, we we kind of wanted to come to you because, yeah. so, so obviously, you know, everybody wants more money, right? Um, and, you know, every time that we come for a specific project, you know, one of our talking points is always um, housing is behind the other categories in the amount of money. And um, so we, we, we're kind of always putting that out there. And, and really one of our purposes tonight was to say, so, so what do we do about that? Because it's not necessarily that, um, you know, you're voting against projects, you know, projects always get approved, sometimes not everything that um, they asked for, um, but, but really we wanted to have some kind of dialogue about, I mean, one way to do it is to increase the percentage and if we don't use it that round, it gets set aside and comes into the next round. Um, uh, does that, does that put, other, you know, what does that sound like to you if we did something like that? Would there be difficulties in your process? Um, really, we just wanted to have some kind of dialogue about do you have ideas or what could work so that we could try to bring that percentage higher and, and closer in line with the, the other CPA categories? I guess I'm trying to understand where you perceive the problem to be with just not looking at the percentages for a moment but I don't think there's been a, a affordable housing project that the committee has not supported ever you'll tell me if I'm wrong but I think every single project affordable housing project has been funded so I don't think it's a question of um, I, I appreciate very much your, your presentation, but I, I and it, it was helpful. But I think there's an underlying understanding of um, the need for affordable housing, the stresses on this community, the growing income inequality, um, 
the impact that has on people. So I, I think there's a very basic understanding of that. Um, I guess, uh, except for the Village Hill, which got less um, than it asked for, I think most of the time we're pretty close to what the ask is in affordable housing projects. So I guess I'm not quite seeing where, where if you look at the percentages, yes, there is a disparity, but if you look at the requests and what has been given, there's lots of other projects we said no to, and you know, on Forbes we gave 100,000, they asked for 400,000, so we've given, even when we've approved, less than has been asked for. So I'm trying to understand what the real nature of the problem is. If there were more affordable housing projects that came before us, and we're in competition with the many historic preservation, open space, recreation projects. You know, I think that would change the mix of the of the of the spending decisions. Um, but they're not there. Um, they haven't come before us. So I'm wondering if you're responding to you know one project in particular, or whether there's a broader issue that you're seeing that affordable housing is really suffering because of the decisions of this committee. Um, can can well, I have one more piece to that? Mm -hmm, sure. So I'm looking at, I'm also looking at our spreadsheet, and I, and I know there were some great projects that came in, in the 2018 fiscal year, and so, you know, that low percentage that you talk about, well, well in that year with lots of great housing projects, 48% of our, of our allocation went to housing. So when the projects are there, which is also your point, we're really interested in it. The second thing that we talk about is if we have enough great housing projects, could we bond a project that's bondable in order to fund the housing projects? And that is the way that we've looked at bonding, actually. So when we were talking about the bonding on Pulaski Park, I think it was, right, on Pulaski Park, the conversation wasn't, we're going to bond Pulaski Park, it's look what bonding will buy us mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. other categories. So I, I think you have to look at that bonding piece. Or, or that's just to give you some perspective of how we think about it, that's how we're thinking about bonding. What do we get when we bond? Where else can we now um, put some money? Knowing that th the housing projects for the most part aren't bondable. Yes. Um, first off, I want to thank you, Patrick. That does sleep to really good information. Um, what I want to add to the two pieces that, that uh, Linda and Julia have laid out, um, almost all of our decisions ultimately are resource driven. And um, <clears throat> one of the criteria I use when I weigh the relative merits of the competing projects is um, how is our investment going to impact the ability of this program, this project to succeed? And um, in many cases, I won't say most, because I don't know if that's true, but in many cases, um, we are not the tipping point kind of money when it comes to a housing project. Um, we are very often, however, the tipping point kind of money when it comes to a lot of the other projects that come before us. Uh, so then it becomes a question for us of, okay, if this project isn't going to live if we don't fund it, um, <clears throat> versus how much of a contribution can we make to a much larger project over here, I find myself in a situation where um, the, the number that I put on the housing project isn't based so much necessarily on um, uh, our ability to drive it forward, but just, you know, how, how can we show the other people who are looking at this project for funding the state or other grantors or stuff like that, that Northampton is committed to this project? And um, I think that that speaks to one of the things. I actually asked Sarah to chat for us. Any project that has come before the CPA that, that increases the supply of low-income housing in, in Northampton has been funded to some extent by this, by this committee. So, you know, 
absent a huge inf influx of, of cash, I'm not I'm not sure. I actually found this idea of of banking set aside money to be um, kind of an intriguing one. I want to think about that some more. But even if you were to just just to think about this hypothetically, even if you were to double the set aside, which this this last go round was I think about one hundred and forty thousand dollars. Even if you were to double that. I'm not yet convinced that that is going to make that huge a difference on a lot of the projects that you guys that, that we have seen come over because they do tend to be you know multi-million dollar projects um, and whether that's going to make it that big a difference it will however make a difference on the other end of the balance sheet um, but that doesn't mean it's not worth considering um, I also think that there's some practical problems which is you know um, Having pots of money, that because of, because so many of our decisions are resource driven, having pots of money set aside um, unspent when there are needs that are going unmet is not a comfortable position for a lot of us. And so if if we were to say, okay, we're going to bank an extra 10% on the set aside for a project that may happen next year and there's a project, a housing project that's looking for funding this year, that's the one we're going to fund. We're not going to rainy day it. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to spend the money that we have. At least that's my instinct. Um, even if, you know, somewhere in the offing we may, we may think that there, there's going to be another project that needs a big, a big influx of cash, we're going to fund the one that we can see. And, and so that this, this idea of doubling the set aside, I don't really think gets us to a place where we're going to have we're going to have a build up of funding over time that's going to leave us with a big pool of money at some point in the future. So. Uh, the, the presentation that you may have seen a little bit of, oh, it's still here. Yes. Um, uh, was was talking about the decrease in the state match from 100 percent to 13.8 which was then increased a little, the base funding match, which was increased a little bit because of a $10 million. So the dollars that we've had um, to work with have um, decreased. You know, they haven't increased it as we'd like them to. And we have bonded for a lot of other projects. So the amount of money that we are trying to parcel out in each round is really really quite small was it 800 and something thousand for two rounds this year so it's it's not it's not a lot of money um, this speaks to the to the resource question so it's it's really a hard thing to when you get all these projects and you know you know with 50,000 this one can go forward and with 60,000, this one can go forward because this has got a match and this has got a grant. And if you don't do it now, it's gone. Um, it's a tough balancing act. And with the housing, um, it's, it's not quite as, for the most part, as finite, definite, and defined that we need you know, a $50,000 match. The projects often come in at an early stage looking for an indication of support um, from the community. The, the designs aren't done. You know, that the tax credit uh, yield is going to vary tremendously. The interest rates are going to vary. The construct By the time you get to the um, final, final budget, it could have changed by $3 million. So more money is obviously going to be helpful to the project. But it's from from our perspective, trying to you know allocate these small dollar amounts, coming up with a convincing case that another fifty thousand or another hundred thousand is is going to make or break that project is a is a very hard case for um, just because the context is different for the affordable housing projects to make so. As we're trying to weigh this stuff, it's very hard because you're looking at sort of a fuzzy number on one end. You want to support it, but it's a fuzzy number, and then you got some projects with some real hard edges where if they don't get that money, they don't go forward. Um, our bonding is going to 
drop off in three years at the end of 21, I think. Well, it, it doesn't, but there's a big chunk. There's a, another couple hundred thousand dollars, I think, 250, 260,000 mm -hmm. a year that we won't be paying. We'll have more money then. Mm -hmm. It'll be easier to give to give more money. Um, I think we would have been delighted to give more money to Village Hill had we had had we had the money. And the reason that we say come back another time is because each time you're looking at a project with against some other competition and you're trying to dole it out and you don't know what's gonna come in the next round. So if you say, come back, you know, maybe there's a chance to give you more in the next round if you come back. So that's that's not a trying to put off that from our, at least my perspective, that's an attempt to say, we're gonna try to do the best we can for you. If you've got a need, come back and tell us about it and we'll see if we can do something for you. It's not easy to come back again. Um, affordable housing developers are used to going for multiple rounds, unfortunately, because you have to go to the state frequently, multiple, multiple times. Um, so there's a method to it, what may seem like madness to. <laughs> uh, Jeff, as a housing person, you want to weigh in? Um, we had a we had a regular monthly board meeting. Uh, Monday of this week and one of the things that comes out in the executive director's report is the waiting list and a waiting list for um, housing units at the at the six properties that we the major properties that we um, cover as we, far we as being the housing authority. housing authority as far as the um, and the uh, even as um, section 8 vouchers hmm. is um, very sad. Um, it's so large that um, I find myself wondering every month. It's like, well, well, this isn't going to happen overnight for somebody that that's on that list. So what is, you know, not only Plan B but you know Plan M or N or O, um, because the the movement there just isn't um, such that that those units are going to be available. So. I'm very sensitive to your presentation, and I, I thank you for that. Um, we we are really, I mean, this we have a lot of tough choices to make here. With uh, and I'm I'm as a housing representative, um, I, I I come here with that focus, but I'm also very sensitive to the the other areas that we deal with, um, historical preservation. Um, a lot of these places, once it's gone, it's gone. Um, conservation of land, I think the city, what the city's been able to preserve um, is wonderful. It's what makes it a great place to be. And, and once those are gone, they're gone. So we find ourselves with a limited pot of money to um, try and spread out. Uh, um, we were, we're just not in a position to take in a budget or a, a proposal like Village Hill and just say, oh yeah, that's that's great. Let's let's fund the whole thing in one round. Um, we don't have the re we don't have the resources to do that and be able to take care of some of the other things. The discussion on bonding um, is very interesting. I haven't been here on this committee all that long. So when that stuff um, we finally get some uh, loosening of our bonding restriction right now and we have more money to, to maneuver um, that'll, that'll be different and hopefully we can we can do more in that area but um, right now um, it, it's just it, it's you know it, it's we try to we try to keep these these projects going and what it's what people have said earlier that they have to come back two or three times um, I like what we've done. I wish we could do more, um, but that's that's where we are right now. Sure. Um, <clears throat> so just to stay on the bonding issue for a minute, and maybe it's a very long-term strategy, and you might know more about this than I do, but 
Is there any conversation with the Northampton Housing Authority to, to develop new affordable housing units, or are they just in the maintenance game at this point? Um, we should have. That's the conversation we should have. Um, there's, there's the things were not settled there for a little while. Yep. We should um, speak to them about that. So it'd be good that, as you know, the pipeline is a major challenge for housing projects. We only have a few um, regional developers, essentially, that like all. The RCC, Wayfinders, Habitat and Humanity, right. all work in multiple communities. Um, so unlike the other categories where it's the Northampton City blank, like it's when they happen to, to turn to us essentially is our opportunity. So having another another body that was developing housing would be um, would help the pipeline potentially. Yeah. I, I would characterize the, the authorities we're, we're playing defense. Yeah. Right now. They could use a real positive board. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I just said, we've we've met with the housing authority. Maybe we try every two years or so to invite um, someone to our meetings. But maybe it's a good time to do that again and open up that conversation. I think that would be good. And and I find the the bonding conversation helpful because you know things that we don't know, and and getting more of that information out is important. I just had one quick question about that, and I apologize for coming late, but I had my church board meeting, and they pay me, so I had to do that first. You know. um, so is it also true with bonding uh, in the other areas that it has to be a city-owned project? So it's like Pulaski Park is city-owned. So that's true across the board. I, I assumed that, but I just wanted to clarify that. And that was really helpful to think about by bonding in other areas, it does free up money and housing and so on. Um, so, so that was helpful. Um, the only other question I, I had was, um, so are you um, able to commit funds to another round? I, I can understand why you're reluctant to do that, but is there a reason that you can't do that? Or I, I was just curious about this. Uh, you're saying just set aside? To, to, to you, set aside? Yeah, or, or if know, somebody comes. I think comes, you're asking some indifference. I talked about a set aside. I think essentially alternate ways of committing forward, like saying, so let's talk about the Village Hill project specifically, except you you had asked like, what is a precipitating thing to have this conversation? Mm -hmm. One of it's Village Hill having to come back for a third time now to get sufficient funding. So we're trying to think of alternate ways, like could we have, could their application for the third time be waived and use the application for the second time? Or is there a way to say like, essentially like an IOU, like we plan to give you $200,000 and the next time that we do a round um, as an alternate form, like, so you won't have committed the money, but it's some sort of like. I think we've seen that every the two times that the TCB came for money for that project, the project was significantly different. Um, it had been split into two. I think the budget, the construction budget had raised by, I mean, we, we're talking about a 50 or $100,000 difference, but the construction budget had risen by a million dollars um, between the first and the second time that we saw the project. I tried to be blunt about that it, when we talked about it. I'm still, I'm still in favor of funding it. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it seems, uh, a little disingenuous to say fifty thousand dollars is keeping the project back when there's a million dollars added, you know, uh, into the budget. However, um, I think from our point of view, we want—I mean, everyone sitting at this table wants to be able to fund projects to the degree that we are the tipping point to getting other sources of funding yeah. released. I think we always ask that explicitly, like, what do we need to do to make sure that someone in Boston or wherever knows that we're behind this project? So I would say for any applicant. Like, as much hard evidence, I know it's fuzzy, but um, you know that that would really help us because yeah. the real projects that are fixing capacity issues in this city are too big to be funded by this body. I mean, we just don't have the money to do it, and I mean, we're not we don't have to build new housing authority projects with the kind of money that we have. Um, I would also say, um, like projects that. The other thing we don't have is like really oversight over projects once they're out the door. Mm -hmm. We had a project come back for, for one kind of emergency funding because mm -hmm. you know the funding that we had given really had no relation to the project that was happening. I don't think you know the TCB project is not like that at all. I think it's a very well managed project. Um, but I know we're seeing things early in the 
Yeah. So it's always a little bit fuzzy on the early side when we're getting the, the local funding. Yeah. Um, but that said, when you look at the last, if you just look at like the last six years mm -hmm. of funding, like we're at like 23, 24 percent. Mm -hmm. So I don't actually think, you know, I think there's a big chunk of money that went out from Pulaski Park and mm -hmm. Florence Fields that changed the numbers drastically. But I do think we're kind of, I mean, I don't know if 25 percent is the right number <laughs> that we're all looking for, but I mean, yeah. It's hard to, if we're going to think about a different type of set aside. I, I actually don't. I, I agree with what you said. I think we're not going. It's not going to change our overall allocation much because I think we're pretty. If, I mean, I don't know. You could talk about open space and recreation really being one category, so maybe a third. Is, I don't know. That's a whole other kind of conversation. But we, you know, for a 19 million dollar project, we could just pour all of our budget into it to get it closer to 19 million dollars. But we're not going to fund anything else. So. Can yeah. we answer? your question we cannot uh, tie a future cycle committee's hands with allocating money for say the fall of 2019 um, other than other than bonding which we do but in the absence of bonding we can only decide what we can do this time and encourage a, a, an organization to, to, to come back uh, Martin, I just have one. Uh, I think thank you everybody for coming what sure. Jeff said about um, the need to balance um, the awards that we make between the different categories because I think Stuart, you said this before that every community is different and you know, Plymouth is all about preservation and Essex County wants to preserve open space. And that Northampton, um, from what I've seen in the little time I've been on this committee, is pretty well balanced amongst the three. And one of the things I, I would suggest um, to think about, you know, I come from the historic preservation point of view, um, you know, we're seeing a lot of properties in Northampton kind of crumble down. And in the time I've been in this community, I think all of the affordable housing projects that have come before us, except for one, correct me if I'm wrong, has been for new construction, um, except for the Sargent House. And I think that there's a real opportunity in the city to really kind of resurrect um, and improve our historic neighborhoods by working with some of the historic structures that we have. And, and, and in so doing, I think in Sargent House, we were able to um, allocate funds from both preservation and housing set asides because it covered both. That's just something to think about for the future. A lot of the historic housing is also in, in the middle of the city. It's accessible uh, to a lot of services and transportation. And it has a lot of advantages. Um, it comes with challenges too, I realize, but that would be another way to approach it. And, um, I thought you might know this. Um, can CPC funds be used to rehabilitate? It's, uh, isn't it only if you use CPC funds initially for a structure? That's <coughs> that's if the um, if the housing is already deed restricted. Mm -hmm. um, so if the housing is market rate, if it's a market rate historic property, by rehabbing it, you're turning it into a deed restricted unit. Mm -hmm. So that's not rehabilitation, that's creation, and that's that's allowed. So one of the problems with that is that you know developers sometimes need scale to make yeah. the numbers work. Yeah. So that's why sometimes the historic properties that are small, it's very hard for them to rehab those into affordable units right. because they need some scale to make affordable units work, and that's why they always sometimes gravitate toward new, new construction. But if you have a mill building or something like that, like Great Barrington is taking a historic mill and putting CPA money into a project there, then you can get some scale. Or, or Williamstown did the same thing with um, cable mills. And um, and Sarah, I, I'd encourage you to check into the bonding thing because um, that may be a, a Northampton sort of a rule or opinion, but we've had dozens of communities across the state bond uh, to participate in private housing projects is done all I, the time. I checked with our bond council and they indicated that it would not be eligible unless it was new. It's, it's with um, the Amherst uh, put a million dollars into Rolling Ridge. Rolling, Rolling Ridge, Rolling yeah. Green. Rolling Green, right? <laughs> yeah. um, Williamstown put 1.5 million into um, cable mills. So these are all privately owned developments. You're basically buying a deed. You're buying the deed yeah, restrictions of the city's. Our bond council said that that restriction was not sufficient to make it an allowable purpose. Yeah, I, I, I'd right. ask again, or, or check with those other communities and how they did it, because it's our database is filled with those projects. It's done all the time. 
it's it's very possible. Yeah, that'd be yeah uh, we have the list. Yeah. Uh, Jack, you want to comment on it? Uh, I, I, just to say that I, of all the requests we get, that these are some of the most complex issues to deal with. It's not in my expertise, but it just there's always multiple agencies involved and multiple partners involved, and it's much more complicated. But that certainly is a worthwhile area that we need to work with. So anything that can help us would be appreciated. I hope that this can be an ongoing conversation. Um, if you like, we could give like a general housing update, kind of like that on another year. Yeah. And uh, hoping to meet with Linda and Jeff separately as their housing reps on the board. Since housing is also a little bit different, we don't have direct representatives from like the Conservation Commission or Recreation Commission. So, be good. Be good. Okay. Other things you want to share with us, Todd or Patrick? Um, one last one question, actually, the Lord. Um, with respect to the grants, it's in. I've watched your previous discussions and appreciate your thoughtfulness in weighing these decisions. It seems like for a number of the other categories, there's like a grant on the table, and if you provide X dollars, you get the project. And my understanding is that the housing grants would not, like, like you have to say we have this much money, and now we're in the pool with the rest of the group as opposed to you won the grant and now I need to go back to my local community and get X dollars in order to actually get the grant. Is that accurate? Yeah. So essentially your grants are, we need the money first. Right. Hopefully this will be enough for us to win as opposed to we have the money, please give us X dollars in order for us to keep it. That's, so that's why the projects come in at sort of this early, early yeah. fuzzy stage. So I think that's a, one thing to keep in mind. Um, i trying to think of one of the points that came up, wanted to potentially clarify. Um, it's lost. So <laughs> you can always come back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, there's a lot of pieces in the air and a lot of things to move. So I appreciate talking it through with you guys. Well, thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks thank you. Yeah. yeah, we're really grateful for your time. Um, yeah. Yeah. We we sit in our meetings and. People ask us lots of questions, and, and so it's really good to just be able to, when there's not a project before us, we can just sit and kind of have this conversation and understand what we each have to face. And, and it allows us to think of other ideas and figure out the better ways to bring things to you. So thank you for that. Uh, thank you. Remember what the point was. <laughs> uh, to, I think it's probably useful in the concept, context of how those grants work that it's pot of money from the local community first as a, so you're not looking to fund a $20 million project with your total like $900,000 pot to work with. It's what do we need to put in in order to win those other grants? Sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, moving right along. <coughs> And staying on the affordable housing theme, um, Sarah will walk us through this request to revise for the Laura is here. here. She she walk us us. Ah, Laura will walk us through. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how much I need to go through this. Um, we sent a, a memo, looks like this. Hope everybody has it. Um, uh, we are not asking at this moment for more money from the state. <laughs> we are asking for a little bit of rejiggering as you we were talking about You know how these things play out and change and shift and we try to capitalize on opportunities. Um, one thing when we bifurcated this project into one that's going forward now and one that will hopefully go forward in the near future, um, the city had committed CDBG money and it just 
became clear that they had a regulatory barrier to using their CDBG funds at uh, 35 Little Chill Road. And so this is a proposal simply to maybe broaden the language of uh, the CPC commitment so that it can flow um, to North Commons where it can take the place. Um, sorry, flow to 35 Village Hill Road to take the place of the CDBG money that will flow to North Commons. So I'm happy to answer questions. What was the regulatory barrier? Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. okay. So the regulatory barrier is, you know, Typically, CDBG is not used for new construction. It's very prescribed the ways you can use it for new construction. Um, and the city had thought that they could use it for soft costs, you know, architect, mm -hmm. design, engineer. And they had in the, past, in the past been able to use it that way, and a new kind of rule uh, became evident that they were not going to be allowed to do that. Um, the other way they commonly use it for new construction is acquisition. And, um, TCP is actually buying, kind of made an offer on both these parcels because 35 Village Hill Road is skinny and small and doesn't have a lot of money. Um, the, the acquisition price is very low, it's $20,000 for that land. So we had hoped to use 50000 of CDBG and there just wasn't a good match between the eligible costs at 35 Village Hill Road and the $50,000 that they had um, set aside for it. So this was one kind of creative way that we thought to keep level funding, level local funding at both sites. And happily this hadn't been to city council yet, so it seemed like there was a good opportunity to mm -hmm. just tweak the language a little bit um, and make it all work out. So Sarah, the, the council order that you sent to us yesterday uh, reflects those changes. Yeah, that so that? it's basically just deleting the specific reference to portion of the of the village home parcel and allowing it to be used for any portion of those two developments. And that meets Laura's needs? It does, yeah. Okay. Uh, and we need to do a motion on that change, yes. is that correct? Um, are we, do we have other questions for Laura? Does anyone need to ask or start? Yeah. So is there a motion to accept the city council orders as revised? Um, regarding the Village Hill project. Moved. Second. Okay. Any discussion on that? All in favor? All opposed? All right, thank you so much. Thank you very much for hanging in here. Um, if you're interested, I bought a few show and tell things about other projects, but I don't want to take your time unless you have what extra time. What other projects? Don't, I, I don't just I brought some photos floor. of the lumber yard and a rendering of Sergeant House. I can just pass yeah. them on there. Sure. Sure. The glory days. Um, Thank you. Interiors at the lumber yard. And when I finally took that big uh, tent off the end of the lumber yard on Holyoke Street, you can see the brickwork. You can drive by and see it again. Thank you. How, how close those. is the lumber yard? How close is it to be finished? Yeah. As close as what I know. <laughs> um, it's due to be complete in May, uh, and so actually the uh, uh, deadline for applications, ten applications, is uh, this Friday. I think we have just over 300 applications so far. And we've got a flurry at the end, so there's 55 units. Just kind of speaking about you know the mismatch between demand and yeah. supply. Right. Um, and so. Uh, we'll do a lottery in February, and we hope to move the first tenants in at the end of May. People will move in kind of staggered through the summer. Um, so I'm pretty excited. So Congratulations. Any, any nibbles coming. on the retail portion of it? Yeah, well, we have, um, we have about 60% of it we stuff. But there's one uh, space, I think it's about 1,500 square feet that's still available. Um, they're both office tenants who would love to have like a true retail tenant, but you know, in a big environment. Um, so, but the kind of uh, prime space right on Pleasant Street is still available. It's reasonably priced. Send anyone you know our way who might want that kind of space. Um, and uh, actually, Sergeant House is, we've selected a Builder, uh, we're getting ready for a construction start also, coincidentally, in May. Um, just we had a new rendering done. Who's the building? Uh, Western Builders. Who's the building? Nice. Gave us actually awesome grace. 
Briefing from our uh, 2018 round two or fiscal year 2019, I suppose, round one. Um, really, the only thing I think we did differently was we went back to uh, once we had everything in the cart, we took each individual item out, out and voted on it. Um, that was Linda's suggestion. <laughs> Do folks have comments? Uh, things that work well? Things to do differently next time? More tough decisions to More make. Calls. More so alcohol. Yeah. 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 Like, right. Start with a bird. There were no lyrics about moths and <laughs> I can do what I can do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that was a setup from my from Sarah. Um, I didn't know that. There is one lichen to let me see if I can remember it. Uh, Freddie Fungus took a took a lichen to Alice Algae, but their marriage is on the rocks. Oh, wow. Um, wow. That's the only lichen joke you'll probably ever hear. Lori Sanders might have a few more. That's true. As <laughs> so get more controversial um, projects, it did more than anything else for getting what we do here out to the public. <laughs> we, that was fantastic. Yeah. We have some like fake projects that are really controversial. <laughs> so it's all those fascists on the garden committee that draw people out. Um, <laughs> Uh, it's the camera off. <laughs> yeah. It's still on. That was a joke. Um, <laughs> right. The last two times I've turned the television, it's been CPC. <laughs> That's <laughs> really, yeah. They had, they had some dead air? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> it's like, oh my God, who would watch this? And then I'm sitting there. <laughs> <laughs> embarrassed to say that. Anything else on uh, round two debriefing? Oh, I'm going to share things to do differently in particular. Just real quickly, do you as a group make any site visits to the applications? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We'll talk about that later. Yeah. That's project dependent. Yeah. So if they warrant site visits, then, then they need to do it. Sarah's been very good on arranging them, and I personally have found them to be really? incredibly useful. Yeah. yeah, I agree. Really helpful. Yeah. Has there been any change to the timeline, or are we still? I think we're we're set with, um, and we'll see what what proposals come in and how quickly we can move forward with them. Our next meeting is February six, is it? So wait, did I just hear you say that the site visit if Miss Flo's diner really does submit is 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 at dinner time? Um, they or, breakfast. Dinner. <laughs> or breakfast? Or uh, breakfast? Lunch, lunch should be good. They do need <laughs> some lunch. That's right. What, 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 they do, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I think so. Uh, we're back to debriefing round two. As we're fading here, any other um, things to do differently is, is the main thing that we can think of. Okay, any other business not foreseen when the agenda was published? Is there a motion to adjourn? So, a second. Uh, 